Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It is so wonderful to have you all with us um, for this uh, really special evening with uh, Chloe Becker, who is just a tremendously gifted artist um, and so uh, sensitive and justice oriented uh, in her work. And so I'm, I'm really excited to hear about her process. Um, rather than open with a said prayer today, I thought we might open with a song and I wanted to sing All Are Welcome uh, together with all of you. Uh, not only because I love the, um, the, the, the basic message of the song, but I also in particular love verse five which uh, reads, let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard, and loved and treasured, taught and claimed, as words within the word. I just love that. I love that idea that um, we need to claim everyone's name and everyone's story and um, recognize that they are all part of the revelation of God. And I think that's what this project is all about. And Chloe does it in a very uh, special way through her art. So uh, please keep yourselves muted at home uh, because we all sing at different um, rates because our internets are at different speeds. Um, so, so please keep yourselves muted, but sing your hearts out at home. We'll sing verses 1 and 5. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end division. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard and loved and treasured taught and claimed as words within the word built of tears and dreams and laughter prayers of faith and songs of grace let this house proclaim from roof to rafter all are welcome all are welcome all are welcome in this place. Well, it is my absolute joy to introduce Chloe Becker tonight. Chloe is what I consider a rising star in the Catholic Church. She is an artist and a future student at Harvard College, the class of 2025. She's currently on a gap year, and right now she enjoys taking on new projects. She's always open to discussing, discussing commissions for all those who are out there thinking of commissioning some art. Presently, she is focusing on how she can use her art to confront racism within the Catholic Church. In Catholic social teaching, the church calls Catholics to dismantle racism, but that is often undermined by the church's quiet complacency and further participation in racism past and present. 
her most recent works help to educate on the lives of underrepresented, uh, underrepresented saints and Catholics of color, calls Catholic, Catholics to engage in racial justice, especially white Catholics, and explores the intricacies of both the exclusion and the power, contributions, and holiness of people of color in the U.S. church. We at Future Church have been working with Chloe over the past year as we develop art for our new Women Witnesses of Racial Justice project. And I have to just tell you, it has been pure joy. We have spent time discussing the concept with, with Chloe, and then Chloe just takes off. She engages her creativity and spirituality in creating these pieces. And uh, so far, she's created nine of the 15 uh, that we uh, have for this project. And every time she sends me a piece, I break down crying. I mean, it's just so beautiful. And the whole staff were just awed by her work. Tonight, we have the gift of hearing directly from Chloe about her process and her work. I just want to say to you all tonight, remember her name. She won't remain a local name for long. My friends, Chloe Becker. My gosh, thank you so much, Deb and Russ, for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, perfect. So I'm really excited to get the chance to speak with you all. Um, but before I start, I think it's important that I recognize my privilege here as a white woman sharing the stories of these incredible black women through my art. Because when someone shares another story, which is necessary to do for most of these women because most of them are no longer here to share their own stories with us. But when we share stories, we always share it from our own perspective, with our own biases on what we think is most important to share. So I have my own inevitable subconscious perspective as a white woman on what aspects of their lives I choose to put in the paintings and how to display that. I try continually to be learning, but there's never a point, especially in a white person's life, where they'll completely understand racism. So I do this art knowing that I'm not an expert and welcome critique when I'm wrong. But I do this because racism was started and is allowed to continue by white people. So in reality, it is truly our responsibility to clean up this mess. That's why I wanted to make these portraits uncomfortable. So they are definitely a celebration of and an opportunity to learn about black history. But they are also just as much a reminder of white people's responsibility to dismantle racism in society today. They are a call to action for white people to examine ourselves and our lives for racial justice. And I'm still very much learning how to answer that call myself. It's a lifelong process of learning and reflecting, making changes in our lives and taking action when it's difficult and uncomfortable. The life stories of these women are so inspiring to look up to because they committed to resistance and racial justice with such conviction. But they cannot be appreciated without each of us genuinely reflecting and changing our own lives to closely reflect that same conviction. So process-wise, I approach each piece almost like an essay. So you can see a few of my sketches here. Um, but so I read a lot about each woman and compile the information into a few main points that I want each portrait to highlight about a woman's life. But instead of writing a paragraph for each main point like an essay would, I instead display those visually through symbolism, references, and colors, which you will get to hear about as I explain each piece. This has really been, in a way, a spiritual process of getting to know each woman. Because when you spend so many hours looking at a portrait while you're painting, it ends up being a very purple way for me to reflect on their lives, even if it's just subconsciously, which has been unbelievably meaningful to me and is a new connection with the women that I hope others can experience when engaging with the art too. 
Future Church has mentioned before that I will be putting out prayer cards on my store soon, which I promise will be coming soon. <laughs> but with the prayer cards, I approach the writing of them really as an extension of the painting. As I love showing ideas through art, like visual art, but I also love writing and want the prayers to be very intentional and thought through. Because even though this sounds cheesy, I do see them as a different form of art about the women. And again, with this art, I'm almost speaking on behalf of these women's life stories, which is a responsibility that should not be taken lightly. Hmm. So that's why I feel I need to be very prayerful about the writing, because then it almost becomes a collaborative process with God and the women. Hmm. Okay, so with that, um, we are going to start exploring the first portrait, which is Sister Antona Ibo. So this painting shows the iconic picture of her speaking to the press at Selma that ended up on the first page of the New York Times. Behind her is the actual crowd from the march. Um, however, if you can spot it, I wanted the crowd to transition from the protesters in Selma to the people at the Ferguson protests for the murder of Michael Brown. This shows the two different crowds that Sister Antona spoke to decades apart in her life. This emphasizes how the racism from the civil rights era is the same racism we see today, just in a slightly different form. The crowd further transitions into the protest for Black Lives Matter that occurred this summer. As although Sister Ebo wasn't alive to speak at the protest, I wanted to further show how racism is continuing throughout time and calls us to confront racism in our present like Sister Antona did throughout her life. Lastly, the dove in the sky, I put as a nod to the Holy Spirit, um, which is how she always gave the Holy Spirit credit because um, she relied on the Spirit so much in her justice work and throughout her life. So next to the image of the painting, I have the actual historical images that I painted from, um, as I will do with the rest of the paintings that I'm about to show. Um, just so that you can see those actual images where I took inspiration. Next is Mother Mary Lang. So Mother Lang is next to a student from St. Francis Academy, which is the school formed by the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the first Black Catholic sisterhood in the U.S. that she founded. I purposefully posed them in the same positioning as the Black, famous Black Madonna, Our Lady of Chestahova, to draw the connection that Mother Lange is a mother figure for not only the church and the Oblates, but also the Black community of which she was a leader for, as they really grappled with such a tumultuous time of history, leading up to and during the Civil War. So in the student's halo, you can see that I wrote, Say Her Name, which is the campaign that was recently created to bring attention to the names of Black women who were murdered by police violence as they're not getting the same public remembrance as Black men are. So I decided to include this campaign as Mother Lang focused especially on women so much throughout her life, beginning with the All Girls School, um, which she started in her home and continuing with the Oblates. So I included the names of these Black women from the Say Her Name campaign in names in the sky near the top. However, near the bottom of the sky, the names start to transition into the rarely known names of the countless Black women who were lynched or raped by white people during this time period that she was alive, which is what I like to refer to as the Say Her Name campaign of the 19th century. So this again refers to the continuity of racism over time, showing how the racism and sexism of Mother Lang's time has just taken a different form into today. Finally, the hands at the top of the painting are layered with meaning and all interpretations apply as I wanted it to be ambiguous so that it could take on different meanings. They can represent the aura of unity that Mother Lang and the Oblates provided for the black community in Maryland. They can represent the women of the names in the painting, both from the 19th century and the 21st, holding hands together in God's kingdom. And they can also represent people holding hands just while praying. The next portrait is Sister Thea Bowman, who Sister Thea is actually my favorite Catholic 
of all time. So I felt a lot of pressure when going into this portrait because I just really wanted to do it justice. So I decided to think about what the essence of Sister Thea is and then to build upon that. So I decided that Sister Thea really could not be represented without the audience being able to feel the joy and lively energy that she's universally known for. So I conveyed this partly through color. As you can see, I used a lot of warm colors on Sister Thea to contrast the blue night sky behind her to almost show her as a beam of light in the night sky. She's also singing or preaching, which was another essential part of her identity. And the crowd she's preaching to is the bishops from the famous talk she gave to the USCCB about what it means to be Black and Catholic, which I felt was an undisputable moment that I needed to include, especially because I think it's such a powerful image to have a Black nun preaching to all of those white bishops. So as you can see with the reference image, I put on the left, those are actually the bishops who were there um, at that speech. But I did make the crowd even larger to show how Sister Thea taught the larger white Catholic community about the beauty and legitimacy of Black Catholic religious expression. And even more so, the urgent need to dismantle racism in the Catholic Church in the United States, something white people are responsible for. Above her in the night sky, I used the constellation almost as like a caption bubble to show what Sister Thea is singing, which is written around the moon. Um, and if you look close, the moon is actually the globe, which was another just symbolic detail I wanted to add. Um, but the quote says, I bring myself, my black self as a gift to the church, which again, is really just the message of her ministry throughout her whole life. Okay, so the next woman, is Mother Anna Bates. So I really wanted to convey how Mother Anna Bates created a church of people through the summer programs that she started in her community long before the diocese finally agreed to grant her community Our Lady of Victory Church. So Mother Bates and her parishioners are standing in the actual shape of the eventual church that they founded to show that Our Lady of Victory and really the Catholic Church worldwide are so much more than the structures that define them. But ultimately, in their most simple form, are the people. So this church imagery is continued with the stained glass behind them that calls out the different ways that the Catholic Church marginalizes and excludes Black Catholic women, something Mother Bates faced throughout her life. So the panel on the left represents the discrimination and lack of representation of Black women in America with natural hairstyles. The middle panel displays a black Madonna chosen to contrast the whitewashing of Mary and Catholic motherhood, as well as the church's ignorance and lack of response to the high rates of infant mortalities for black mothers, which is caused by racism, something that's a dire life issue. And finally, the right panel conveys how African-American song and spirituals are excluded from what is viewed as quote unquote typical or traditional masses and prayer services. And are even seen by many white Catholics as not being Catholic song. I chose the stained glass window because I wanted to convey how it has been one of the historically least likely art forms to celebrate black figures. So this stained glass panel is a protest celebration of Black Catholic women, displaying a future church where they are centered and valued. So the next woman is Mother Henrietta DeLille, which I wanted to focus on her identity as a biracial woman. Um, biracial woman. So her father was white and her mother was Black. And sometimes that identity is overlooked or people will portray her with darker skin than she actually had. So I thought it was really important to accurately display her paleness, to not downplay her light skin privilege, but also to recognize that in the racial hierarchy she was in, blackness was so disdained that the genealogy of each person was so well known by the communities in order to classify people as black if they had quote unquote one drop from the one drop rule. They were treated as such. So really, I don't think her light skin is something to cover up, but speaks to a horrible aspect of American history where black people were so unbelievably feared and hated by white people that there was an obsession with genealogy 
to keep white genes quote unquote pure. So not only is she biracial, but she also worked with both white people and black people despite the strict hierarchy in New Orleans. With the interracial sisterhood that she started to try and form um, and eventually how the black Catholic sisterhood that she helped form the Sisters of the Holy Family served people despite of their place in the racial hierarchy. So the two hands reaching across each other um, are just this representation of both of those aspects of Delil. The two hands raised with the words, hands up, don't shoot, is the connection that I have drawn to the present. As I was really inspired by seeing black and white people next to each other, holding their hands up and saying this chant at the protest for Black Lives Matter this past summer. In the spirit of Mother DeLille's interracial work, I wanted to emphasize the call us Catholics have to truly do interracial justice work. This means that when addressing anti-black racism, white people have an obligation to be genuinely in solidarity with black people, not just when it's comfortable, but to stand with black people when it's most inconvenient for us. This is why I have the phrase, hands up, don't shoot that has been recently popularized to represent the police brutality that so many black people have faced and have had their lives cut short because of. To be truly interracial, white people must literally and figuratively stand alongside black people in moments as difficult as this phrase. Finally, the hands coming from the sky holding the sacred heart is a reference to the name from the sisterhood that Delil helped found, the Sisters of the Holy Family. So I wanted to show a depiction of the Holy Family as Black to honor the Black identity of the sisterhood. So one hand represents Joseph, the other Mary, and the Sacred Heart is for Jesus. And then finally, the background is intentionally displaying a New Orleans nature scene as the context of the racial hierarchy in Louisiana is something I thought was necessary to understand the weight of how radical DeLille and her commitment to interracial work was. And then one last um, side note, in the images on the left, I included my sketch of this painting so that you could see side by side kind of the transition. All right, Sister Martin de Porres Gray or Patricia Gray. So for Gray's portrait, I wanted to focus on how she centered Black women. As I remember reading in an article that the National Black Sisters Conference was, which she is known for founding, um, was just truly joyful and free. And it really struck me that Gray created such a sacred space for Black Catholic women to meet and no longer be the outsider, to be temporarily relieved from the suffocation of racism and patriarchy. So I have Patricia Gray in front of the women from the conference. As you can see on the left, this is the actual image from one of those early meetings. Um, and I thought that I could portray this idea that the conference was a sanctuary by having the land and the sky around them be the luscious, almost transcendent landscape of the Sahel in the rain season in Central Africa. Symbolically and emotionally representing this almost utopia. Because really the problems of racism and patriarchy are rooted in colonization. Because black women in the US have yet to experience the same complete freedom that women in Africa had before white people, specifically white men, colonized, kidnapped, sold, and enslaved them. Before this, understandably, there wasn't white supremacy. And additionally, history indicates that African women were valued, centered, and free in most communities in pre-colonial Africa. Something that black women are only able to temporarily experience in spaces like the Black Sisters Conference that Gray created. Lastly, the young girl looking up to Gray, I included to symbolically show how black children, both at the time and for generations to come, are able to be empowered by seeing a black woman in a public position of leadership. As Gray was the president of the conference for years, and ever since then, the conference has only had black female presidents. Oops, Mother Mathilda Beasley. I was, so I was personally really moved by the secret school that Mother Mathilda started in her home to educate free and enslaved Black children in the early 19th century, which was extremely illegal to do in Georgia at the time. Something she did before she even became a nun. So I wanted to use that to represent her devotion to Black children and to Black Georgians throughout her life. So the house behind her is actually that house. You can see the picture on the left. 
as I've mentioned before, this was before the Civil War. So all of this was happening while people were being enslaved around her. So I used the sky to symbolically display this. The clear blue sky between the home's um, door and the windows symbolizes the hope that she built for the students she had living under the suffocating conditions of slavery in a deeply racist society, which is represented by the contrasting, dark, threatening sky above. Finally, the phrase in the grass, not yours to own, has a dual meaning to acknowledge her identities. So firstly, her identity is a black woman. In this context, the phrase signifies how black people are not anyone's to own, not through enslavement, nor the less literal owning of black people through the dehumanization of racism. The other meaning honors her Native American heritage. As her father was known to be indigenous, although we unfortunately don't know what nation he belonged to. But from this perspective, the phrase reminds us that indigenous land, which has such sacred importance to indigenous people, is not to be owned. Not by any individual, but especially not by the white colonizers who stole the land through forced removal and the genocide of what is widely estimated to have been 20 million indigenous peoples across the Americas. The phrase applies then as it does today, as Black and Indigenous communities in the US continue to resist racism's inherent owning of their identity, their power, and their land. Now we have um, Anne Marie B. Craft. Um, so in this painting, I wanted to show the two schools that Anne Marie taught at. So the building on the left represents the school that she founded in Georgetown at age 15 years old to serve black children after a discriminatory law pushed many of them out, out of school. There isn't an actual photo of her school, so it's not completely accurate, um, but it is a guess at what it would have looked like. And on the right is the building um, for St. Francis Academy, which is where she taught after she joined the Oblate Sisters of Providence. And if you can see, both of the buildings I painted have students in the windows, just to support the fact that these are schools, but also to show that the quote in the sky is not just to represent Anne Marie, but also to represent her students, and even further, all Black children throughout history and today. Because the phrase says, degrade our minds, our souls, our youth, but still we rise, which is a clear reference to Maya Angelou's Still I Rise poem. I included this quote to directly name how white society has disenfranchised Anne Marie Beecraft and really all black children. They've degraded her mind by limiting access to education, like the DC policy that pushed so many black students out of school or the underfunding of schools in black communities we see today. We also see this through the propaganda that insinuates that black people are incapable of being smart, a lie that we find existing in so many aspects of America. Society has degraded their souls as when Beecraft was alive a significant amount of white people believe that black people did not have souls. A belief we still we can still find remnants of today in the lack of mainstream religious art depicting black people. This additionally exists in white people's suspiciousness of black people's goodness, um, which can be subconscious or overt. Finally, the society has degraded black youth through systems that stunt their futures, like the school to prison pipeline. And by perpetuating the lie that the power of black young people is foolish and incapable of impacting society. The same lie that Anne Marie likely faced as she fearlessly harnessed her power at age 15, yet still she and so many others continued to rise. And so our last portrait for tonight is Mother Mary Theodore Williams. Um, so as you can see on the left, this portrait is based off of the actual image that I found that shows a Franciscan handmade sister, um, which is the Black sisterhood that Mother Williams founded, which with some of the children that they were serving in Harlem. I love the image as a way to show her commitment to Black youth. So I just changed the sister to be Mother Williams. I wanted to have her pointing toward the rising sun as a metaphor for how she was always looking for that next possibility, whether it was forming her religious order or moving them to Harlem or the multitude of initiatives that they started to serve their community. 
Mother Williams was always looking toward the next possible step to take. Thus, the night sky behind them is gradually getting lighter to show that the sun is rising in front of them. This is reinforced by the painted quote, the heart of a woman goes forth, for, goes forth with the dawn, which is the first line from the poem, The Heart of a Woman by Georgia Douglas Johnson, a black poet from the Harlem Renaissance, as Williams moved her order to Harlem during the time of the Harlem Renaissance. However, the dawn is also a much greater symbol for the hope needed to commit to the difficult work of dismantling racism. The complete eradication of racism in all forms may be far away, but we can learn from Mother Williams. Don't allow our despair to stop us from continually pursuing that next possibility for a, a more just world. In hopes that one day, the sun representing a united world will fully rise. Thus, the children can also represent future generations being figuratively guided by Mother Williams in their justice work. Their colorful clothing conveys this hopeful energy. Um, as you may have noticed, these colors were inspired by the bottom reference image, which I included. Um, so I found this image off of the Franciscan Handmaid's Facebook, and it shows people performing in cultural African clothing. So I decided to add a layer to the portrait of pride for African heritage and culture as well. I thought that would correlate well um, with the embracement of African American culture that occurred during the Harlem Renaissance. Okay, so finally, I've included here some artists that are doing similar work to me, because I think it's my responsibility to stress that I'm not doing anything completely new here. My art isn't saying anything that hasn't been said before, and it's built on the work of other Black artists and thinkers who have been tackling white centeredness in art for decades. So I included Titus Gaffar, Kindi Wiley, and Armonio Rosales, who are just a few of the many artists who inspire me and who have been leading this work longer than I. So if you haven't heard of any of these artists before, I definitely encourage you to check out their work if you enjoyed mine, um, because they're really awesome. So I hope that the paintings invoked in you a longing to learn more and to continue to follow the series as more resource packets are released through Future Church. Um, so I think it's probably time to take questions. I'll stop sharing. Great, gosh. I'm sorry, I'm speechless. It's <laughs> just incredible. Thank you so much. So the way that we do our Q&A is um, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand with that little hand signal or if you unmute your mic, you will come to the top of the list and that uh, opens, then I will call on you and then you can ask Chloe your question. So, um, so I see here, we've got a question from Faith Kemper. Hey, Faith Kemper, uh, how are you? How are you? I'm great. So talk to, to ask your question of Chloe. Thanks a lot for being here. I, I do <clears throat> actually I have a question about two of the different um, women that you have um, painted or you've depicted. Um, the first one is about um, Matilda Beasley. I noticed that um, in your rendering, um, she is holding her, I guess it would be her left hand down. You've painted her in such a way that she's holding um, the hand of someone that we don't see. And I really like that because to me, it just is portraying, you know, that hand that she's holding is the image of all of the children that she educated. And I was wondering if that's what you meant to portray. Yeah, that was actually exactly it. I, I like had to kind of try and make this concise because I could ramble about paintings <laughs> forever. So I didn't include that, but yes, that is that. And yeah, I just, Sometimes I like putting stuff in there that's like really ambiguously symbolic because I think uh -huh. that that man could stand for other stuff too. Um, kind of like the idea of like you stand on the shoulders of those who have come before you, that type of an idea too. But it was intentionally about the children. So you're right. Okay. And the second question I had was about um, uh, Mother Henriette um, De De DeLille. Is that how you say it? Um, and I don't know, maybe I, you know, I was trying, I was taking my glasses off and on and trying to look at it carefully because 
this time of day, my eyes start getting a little wonky on me. But in the image of the hands coming into the picture from the top, presenting the heart, mm -hmm. um, it looked like they were both left hands. <laughs> that it's was probably just like my, I have a really hard time like finding images for paintings that aren't like copyrighted. So I had to like find images online. So I, you know, flip them. So okay. yeah, that wasn't intentional, but that was very observant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Because I kept looking at that going, am I seeing that correctly? Is the thumb on the, the they both? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Faith. Chloe, um, I have just as it's bringing up something for me a little bit, uh, we're going to get everybody else's questions too, but um, whenever you are, so when you're starting a painting, I, I see your sketches, are, is every single detail already decided in your mind, like this will mean this, this will mean this, or do sometimes uh, things just happen? Uh, I. I'm just wondering about maybe how organic it is or how versus how planned it is. Um, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so it's so hard to describe. It's kind of like a musician trying to say how to write a song. Like it's, mm. it's hard to like, it doesn't happen the same time every time. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say like normally, so I know exactly what I want to say with the painting before I start visually thinking about it. So I have like mm. my main points. And then the details are sometimes, like sometimes you really have to grit through and be like, I really don't know how to represent this. And it's more like really manual work. Um, and other times it just pops into you. And that's kind of part of like the spiritual aspect of it is that like a lot of times ideas will just come like from outside of you um, or you'll stumble upon a picture that will just like, you'll just see the whole scene in your mind. Like I see them as like scenes and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's so hard to describe, but I would say it's definitely a mix of organic and then the manual kind of, you know, when it's not working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and did your, and did your sense of, did this way of sort of visualizing concepts or ideas or things you wanted to do, did that start early in your life or did this, is this something you honed? I mean, you're not very old, so, but, but I mean, so you're pretty, you know, you're young, but it's, it's, I'm just wondering, cause it's so, I, I mean, it's such an incredible art and such an incredible talent and gift. So I just wondered how, when you started noticing it. I would say, um, I, so like my sophomore year of high school was the first time I really started painting like seriously. Um, and I did a lot of self portraits and all of those were very symbolic, kind of similar to this style, but hmm. this is definitely like, with every painting, you just like gain so many new tools to like work with. So I think that now it's a lot more referential and less just like, I was just using kind of like random symbols in the beginning, but now I try hmm. and make them a little bit more specific um, okay. to reference things. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just always loved symbolism in, mm -hmm. in books. I've always, always like looked for that. And I think that's just like a part of my, the way my brain works, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a question from Elaine. Um, uh, let me, um, it's not a question. It's really a, a comment and a congratulations. Um, yeah, I'm in Baltimore and that's the home of Mother Mary Lang. Uh, where St. Francis Academy is and where the Oblate Sisters of Providence, their, um, their home, I guess, is. Um, and there's a real push to help to try to get Sister Mary, Ma um, Mary Lang to be saint, mm -hmm. her sainthood completed. Right. But also one of our parishioners, and I won't know her name because I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure I know who purchased um, some of your um, portraits and we are, they're displayed in our church. Yeah. Um, so get a lot of people now we don't get to enjoy them quite as much because we're still doing live streaming so we don't have um, you can't just sit there and, and, and admire them but I'm, I'm sure that when we do get to be in person and we get you know a large congregation they will be displayed and appreciated so thank you for making our church a little more beautiful. Elaine, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, so I know we're, I work with the person who, who purchased those, uh, but 
what do you think that the oblates will think of the the piece of art? Do you do you know any of them well enough to know how they will feel? Because the message, say her name, is I mean, it is very contemporary, and for some people, it's a little edgy, you know, uh, for white people. And which is part of the reason I love it so much as to remember all the black women who have been killed. But what do you think they'll think about these? Do you have I, any I, sense? Right, I don't have a sense. Um, okay. okay. I'm sure we could probably, um, I think the our, our purchaser might have a little bit better connection with um, some yeah. of the sisters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we certainly okay. do it at our church. So we could yeah. I know. query. Yeah. yeah, okay, very good. Thanks, Lynn. Uh -huh. Okay, we have a, a question from Monica Marie Kaiser. Uh, Chloe, when you were talking about the uh, the prayer cards that you were making, the language that you were using sounded like icon writing. And I was just wondering, do you feel that way or do you do any of that when you're putting together your paintings? Um, have you... Do you know any icon iconographers or have you studied with them? That's what it looked like to me. And I was just wondering about that. Because when you get to making con icons, you let me know. I will buy the first three you get. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually pretty unfamiliar with how to make icons, but um, I do know like Kelly Lattimore icons. Um, yeah. That's like kind of where my awareness stops, but I didn't know that that was um, a parallel that you could draw. So that's really cool. I'll look into that. Yeah, that's another artist that, um, if you don't know that name, Kelly Lattimore has done a beautiful piece and he did um, sort of a Pieta style piece most recently, which I just, just loved and broke my heart after, uh, I think it was after George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's called Mama and, uh, so there is, there's, a, you know, Chloe is one of the many great artists out there who are doing, who's doing this beautiful work. Sue Wilhelm, you have a question. Uh, more of a comment, probably, I should say. Um, I want to say thank you for how you wove this rich history that we don't hear about um, from our Black religious women and or Black women who have fostered life and children and, um, and worked for justice. And how you tied that to the contemporary issues of today was just very touching to me. And yes, I had the same thought about iconography. I feel like you are touching us with um, a prayer card that it draws us into the life and spirit of the person and I just want to say thank you to your own faithfulness to um, the inspiration of the spirit, your own faithfulness to prayer and study so that you could bring these to us. I am so grateful for that. Um, I'm wondering how I might get a hold of you to come and share some of this with other groups. Thank you so much. That is really sweet. Um, yeah, that is really sweet. Um, I, I think Russ put my website in the chat. So if you ever wanted to contact me, I am definitely like a little booked in the next like month or so. Um, but like, I'm like, like Deb said, like, I'm always open to discussing things. I, being on a gap year has been really wild because you never know when, you know, what your time is going to look like, what your schedule is going to look like, but you can totally contact me. My email is there my um, art social media is on there as well. So feel free whenever to reach out. Thank you. And if all else fails, just write me and I will uh, get you connected. So mm -hmm. uh, Rita Houlihan, uh, you're up. Oh, hi, oh, thanks so much. Um, I put my question in the chat to uh, keep it very focused here. Thank you. First place, uh, congratulations and um, and, and thank you, Deb and Russ, for bringing this all together. It's just so rich. Um, so uh, I've, um, are, are you aware of other young artists who are committed to using art to hopefully, you know, end, if we can, ever racism and hopefully sexism too? I don't have any specific names in my 
mind, um, which is unfortunate. It's kind of hard to, cause like, it's hard to get connected with people unless you get like a public boost. So like, I was very lucky that for some reason, the mural I did at my high school was able to gain like traction online so that people know about me. But for a many, for many young artists, that's not really the case for them. So uh-huh. I just, I really hope to connect with more people, but I don't know any particular names right now. So I'll just say, I've had a dream for a couple of years of bringing together young artists and um, doing short presentations on the women who, uh, the leaders from the Bible who are omitted from the Catholic lectionary for the most part. And just doing, having great storytellers, biblical scholars tell their stories and then let let the young artist go f- go wild with it, basically. So, um, so uh, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, let Devin know must few, know. Like, spectacular artists that tackle. I know a few like artists that aren't Catholic or religious yeah. in their art that do like talk about um, racism in their art centered mm-hmm. on that. Um, but I, so maybe. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, yeah. yeah. So, but I. Uh, Anyhow, if you're interested in uh, pursuing any kind of uh, new art on other uh, women missing from our from our public consciousness, um, that would be another fat, fabulous area to explore. But thanks for your great work. Thank you. And we have Lori Stanley. You have a question? I do. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Very beautiful. Thank you, Chloe. I was wondering if there was an event that precipitated that the sense, the sensitivity Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. for Black and African Americans, and if so, I don't know if you mind sharing that, or was it the way you were raised? What what do you think precipitated this intense passion that is really a tool for evangelization? I think. Yeah, so thank you again. Um, So I started this basically in my junior year of high school. I went to a Catholic all-girls school and I was lucky to get sent um, to a student diversity leadership conference. It's like this national national conference um, that is like all about talking about racism, like very openly and other issues too. Um, but it was really centered on racism. And that was the first time that I had really thought about racism. Like I grew up very sheltered in a predominantly white city, schools, all of that. Race was rarely talked about. Um, and it was the first time I was one of the only white people in a room. It was um, just a very life-changing experience for me. And so basically I came back from the conference and then just dove into researching. Like I just was reading all of the time about racism all things that I could. And then um, this was like happening at the same time that I started really thinking about my faith more. And um, so I just like kept reading about Catholic articles because it was just so interesting to me how the church had, you know, black Catholics in them. Like that was one of the main things that I was shocked by was diversity within the church, specifically African-American Catholics because I literally had no like representation, no understanding. I didn't know any. Um, And I was just like very embarrassed that I didn't know how many like African-American Catholic communities there were um, and know about just like the horrible history of the church's enslavement of black people, um, like the segregation, all of that. Um, So, basically what happened was I had a project in my theology class where we basically had like a big semester project, choose any injustice and do something to ease that injustice in the world. It could be anything. And so I chose racism in the church um, because I just, I just couldn't get over that. And um, the idea that I had gone so many years in Catholic school and hadn't known that there were two black Catholic churches, like very close to my house or that, um, I didn't know more than one black saint. So um, that's why my work is kind of the way it is today because it's very much focused on like the idea and the education primary. Mm -hmm. So it's, I definitely, that's why I say it's kind of like an essay because I think about the idea and what do I need to get across first? Because 
I just, that education piece of, you know, missing that in Catholic churches and Catholic schools was really um, something that I resented and wanted to contribute to ending. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. You just brought me to tears when I was watching your presentation because what a gift that you're using so responsibly. And so I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I agree, Lori. I'm, I'm crying through this thing myself again. Um, I can't help it. <laughs> Beauty makes me weep. Um, I I've lost my list of questions. Oh, oh dear, let's see here. Participants, does anybody else, does anyone else have a question? Let's make sure that we've gotten that. Um, I do, but I don't know how to do the computer hand read. Oh, you're good, go ahead, Marie. My question is actually for you, Deb. Yes. What are your plans long-term for the series of these portraits? <laughs> oh boy, that's a good question. Uh, well, we're, we are going to consistently put them out there. Uh, we are finding that people are, as, as it becomes more and more known, Uh, she muted herself. Self, Deb. <laughs> she looks like Marie. Look, look at the award. <laughs> Seems as though she. Um... Deb, we can't hear you. Deb, were you plugged into earpods or something? Yeah. Am I muted now? Okay, you're good now. You're good now. Okay, I, I just took them off because I don't know what I did. Sorry. Uh, so. Um, we, uh, so just to say part of the first part of this uh, process or project that we have called Women Witnesses for Racial Justice is uh, 15 uh, portraits of 15 black Catholic women who have uh, changed the church. Um, this whole project is underneath the guidance of uh, Dr. Shannon D. Williams. I don't know if you know her name, but she spoke at LCWR um, a few years back and uh, she's on our board now. And, and so there's lots of work, I think, with a lot of people, a lot of Catholics now, uh, anti-racism work. But I think our focus is uh, very um, inspiring because we're not just talking, uh, we're, we're talking about the work for racial justice. We're talking about reparative justice. We're talking about reparations. We want Catholics to get to a place where you recognize that we, we have to actually make big changes and, and, and make reparations for the damage that has been done and to learn our own history, our own complicity and actually leadership when you look at the long history of the Catholic church in creating this problem in the States and so um, we, and, and throughout the world actually. And so, uh, so th this is the first phase and uh, we, just, we just had America pick up these portraits uh, and they're going to, America Magazine is going to use them uh, in, in some uh, uh, piece that they're doing. And so we, as people see them <laughs> and are touched by them in the same way we're touched by them, uh, they are, they're generating a lot of interest. And Brian Massengale, who is a black Catholic priest, uh, very much a prophetic voice in the Catholic church is very thrilled by them. And uh, so he's also, so it's just people like that are spreading the word. And, uh, and so we hope to uh, spread them, uh, you know, very widely. You can go to Chloe's um, uh, website to get uh, a print. And like she said, she's going to have these prayer cards. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful to work with her. And we're kind of, kind of finding her was really, really a, a graced time too, because we saw the mural that she did for Magnificat. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is, this person would be wonderful. And we looked far and wide for artists. Uh, and of course, I mean, we looked, actually, we wanted to uh, find an artist of color but we were not able to actually accomplish that. So uh, it's not that, you know, but going to, to Chloe and, and finally seeing her work and going, oh my gosh, she's, her heart is right in this. She's, she's able to really t 
tell a story with the images. So we feel very, very, very blessed and graced to have her doing this project for us. So, so this is one part. We have many phases of this. The work is going to be long. It's going to be years in the making, but uh, we have um, uh, a, lots of different phases to this. And this is just the first phase. Any other questions? Let's see here. I've got it. Okay. Chloe, that very first picture you had, which was a collage of many of your portraits, is that available? Sorry, I was muted. Um, I can make it available. I literally just made that on my slides, my Google slides. But I think I think um, that Deb has a better collage than I do. I just kind of put that together. Well, you definitely have the Holy Spirit really touching you on this. Thank you. Thank you. Very true. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I hear that you are going to make prayer cards. Uh, is, do you have to get permission from the uh, congregations to do that? Hear her voice. <laughs> um, no. I mean, this is original artwork. So we have not gotten permissions from anyone uh, because it's original work. Okay. And my, my next thing is uh, Mother Lang was born in 18, 1894. Mm -hmm. and, I think I think that needs to be changed. She was born in 1894. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. That's okay. See, um, when when you're doing things like that, you have to go to the source so you can get it right. But um, um, I must have just put the wrong number. Yeah, I, I, it's easy to do, but I just I just wanted to mention that. Thank are you, you an all, Are you an Allblate sister? I am. And how do you feel about the art? Of, of Mother Lang? I think, I think it's, it's, it, it does some justices, uh, you know, uh, what can I say? It's, it's, it's not like some others that I've seen. So I, 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 can, deal, I, can, I can live with that one. I think <laughs> she, did a, she did a pretty good job on it. Uh, okay, good. All right. I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm very curious about what, what the community would think of, uh, you know, various communities would think of these uh, founder, foundresses or founders who are, um, you know, being depicted. So, right. Great. Other questions? We have maybe time for one more and then our hour is almost up. And I've lost my list. So I'm just speak up if you have a question. Okay, I don't see any more mics undone, so maybe we're finished. Oops. Selena, just on oh, oh, Sheila go ahead. Moon. Selena had her her hand up. I oh, don't... Okay, I'm sorry. I wanted to hear. Yeah, no. go ahead, Selena. Hi, thank you. I I did have my hand up, but I realized in the interim that um um you had done what I was going to ask. I was I was going to ask if you were aware that there were three historically black um, congregations of religious women. Um, and, um, and then I realized, yes, yeah, she does, because you mentioned the Franciscan handmaids, and you mentioned the Oblates, of course, and you mentioned Henriette de Lille, founder of the Sisters of the Holy Family. One little thing, though, the Franciscan mm -hmm. handmaids of Mary, please, you got to know, they are the Franciscan handmaids of the most pure heart of Mary. And that's that's how they are known. They don't want you to forget that most pure heart. I'm writing it down right now. Thank All you. right. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. You're welcome. Thank you. One of the things that I really have appreciated about uh, Dr. Shannon D. Williams' work is she's really written the story and tells the story in a way that helps us to understand how Black Catholic women religious desegregated their communities. They desegregated the church, um, you know, uh, and for me, that's just, that's um, such a powerful new way for me as a white person to think about it. And so, um, 
we hope that through this this art and through the educational pieces that that uh, and as we have speakers uh, Shannon Dr. Williams will be speaking with us on uh, March 9th so if you want to join us for the next women witnesses for racial justice um, presentations. She'll be talking about Black Catholic women, her work, her research, which is very interesting. And then in April on the 6th, we have Olga Marina Segura, who has just released a book called Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church. And she's going to talk about her book. So we have, uh, you know, that's just the, the very, uh, you know, next couple lineups. So, so uh, we're hoping that you'll join us. And also on the 25th of February, we're playing, praying the Black Catholic Rosary, History Rosary together. And we, um, and that rosary was created by Dr. Kurt Gaddy. Uh, so we um, hope that you can join us for these prayerful times, for these learning times, for these art times. It's, you know, we're very, very, uh, energized by this work and hopefully it will bring healing and justice in the church. So Russ, I've talked enough, so maybe you can finish up here, huh? Uh, thank you, uh, Chloe. Oh, let me get my reverb off here. Thank you, Chloe, and, and thank you, Deb. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us tonight for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, as Deb said, uh, we will be um, having a lot more uh, coming up here. So you're already all on the uh, email list, so you'll be getting those emails uh, to join us. So we hope to see you in the future. I thought as a way to close, we'd sing uh, a song that I think Chloe may have made reference to earlier on. It's, I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. It's a song that uh, Sister Antona Ibo um, loved to sing uh, when, I, when I read about her. Uh, that's what, one of the things that stood out in my mind. And, and Chloe mentioned that she, was, um, she always gave credit to the Spirit wherever she went. Yeah, hear you. Um, and um, I thought it would be good to sing that song uh, because I, I think in many ways that applies to all of uh, the women that we've learned about tonight. And it certainly applies to Chloe and the art that she's created. So uh, just follow along. I'm going to switch the words up uh, on a few verses here. And uh, you'll, you'll know what the words are because I'll introduce them. I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do What the Spirit says do I'm gonna do, oh yeah I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do what the Spirit says do, I'm gonna do, oh yeah. I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go where the Spirit says go. I'm gonna go where the Spirit says go. Where the Spirit says go, I'm gonna go, oh yeah. I'm gonna go where the Spirit says go. I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna paint what the Spirit says paint. I'm gonna paint what the Spirit says paint. 
What the Spirit says paint, I'm gonna paint, oh yeah. I'm gonna paint what the Spirit says paint. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do. I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do. What the Spirit says do, I'm gonna do, oh yeah. I'm gonna do what the Spirit says do.
Women of the church, how rich is your legacy? Women of the church, how great is your faith? Women of the church, wellsprings of integrity, lead us in the ways of Living signs of service and strength, hands of healing, hearts of love, women of vision, voices for the voiceless, lead us in the ways of hope. Women of the church, how rich is your legacy? Women of the church, how great is your faith. Women of the church, wellsprings of integrity, lead us in the ways of peace. Women of compassion and care, bearers of God's life-giving light, Centered in prayer while working for justice, lead us in the ways of peace. Women of the church, how rich is your legacy? Women of the church, how great is your faith? Women of the church, those springs of integrity. Lead us in the ways of peace. Lead us in the ways of peace.